Welcome to Eric's Perspective. Uh, joining me today is the Executive Director of the Museum of African American Art, Keisha Dumas Heath. Keisha, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, and I should say that we are actually recording this, first of all, on the 100th birthday of uh, the founder of this museum, Simona Lewis. Uh, and we're also at the museum. We're doing this uh, at the museum. So thank you for allowing us to do that. And thanks again for being a guest. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, Keisha, I thought we would start by perhaps talking a, a little bit about the uh, founding of the museum itself, since we brought up uh, Simella's name. So give us a little bit of a history of the Museum of African American Art. So the museum uh, was founded by Dr. Samela Lewis, noted artist, uh, art historian, collector, uh, professor, and author, and a group of uh, community leaders uh, in 1976. And the original location of the Museum of African American Art was actually in Santa Monica on Lincoln Boulevard. Um, and there's now, it's, I think the address was 2617, Lincoln Boulevard. There's now like a Gelson's and a strip mall there. Um, but that was the original location. However, the museum has actually been in the current location at 4005 Crenshaw Boulevard since 1980. So, 1980. So yes. we're sitting in the space right now as we talk yes. in the same space that uh, it all started in in, uh, in 1980. Absolutely. Amazing. Absolutely. Amazing. So I don't think a lot of people would realize that Santa Monica was really the spot where it was uh, uh, founded. That's pretty incredible with a really small black population and so forth. It's true. It's true. Most people don't, don't realize that, uh, that the museum, even as part of its name, had the Museum of African American Art of Santa Monica. Oh, in that those, was a part of the, o the those, overall title. In those early, in those early years, the, the materials that we have in the museum's archives actually say, of Santa Monica on, oh, on, those, wow. on those early uh, exhibit flyers and postcards and invitations. Wow. You know, just a little side point. So back in 2002 at my gallery, which used to also be located in Santa Monica, we did a benefit reception for the Santa Monica Gems, spelled G-E-M-S. Mm -hmm. And it was designed to help African-American students in Santa Monica, young students, uh, high school and even junior high, not only to raise money for scholarships and so forth, but also to um, encourage them in their academic pursuits and so forth, just in general with confidence building activities and so forth. I bring that up only because I said before it was a 4% black population, but the black population that was there was pretty longstanding and significant and very tight knit and was decimated by the building of the Santa Monica Freeway, which went, of course, through the black community, and a lot of people lost their homes and had to move out. But yes. I just thought I would say that because not a lot of people realize that there's this um, sort of long history from the founding of the city itself in the 19th century, having African Americans a part of the community there. There definitely is that history, yeah. a, very, a very cohesive uh, community. And unfortunately, so many times when development and Freeways in particular come through, there is that, that element of displacement that happens. Yes. Historically. So um, we're actually sitting in this big room here, and surrounding us is the uh, work by an artist named Ace Bourne, and this show will be up until April the 28th. Uh, what prompted the uh, museum to uh, choose uh, Ace Bourne as, as the artist for this particular exhibit? The Museum uh, of African American Art, uh, throughout its history, one of the things that we're most most proud of um, being able to do <clears throat> in and for the, the community where we are is to be a venue, often uh, a, a first solo exhibit venue for local artists. And so Ace Bourne is a dynamic young uh, contemporary painter and muralist who comes from uh, Inglewood. So he's here, he's from here in the LA area, very near the, very near the museum. And so we are just honored and pleased to be a venue where he can have his first solo exhibit. Um, he's probably best known right now as um, the artist who did the, the beautiful uh, mural of Kobe Bryant and Gianna that's in downtown Los Angeles mm. on Flower Street. And so um, we've had a lot of interest from, from people who come in to see 
you know, more of his more of his work. Ah, so they've Beautiful. seen that mural and they've they come the in out of curiosity to see more of his work. Absolutely. Oh, that's fantastic. It is. Yeah, yeah. It is. And, and this room is big and spacious and seems ideal for a presentation like this. But we should also point out there's other exhibition rooms in this uh, museum. Right there, there are so so where we are right now uh, what is where we call the main gallery, mm-hmm. and so this is, this space, the main gallery, was part of the original donated space uh, for the museum in this building in 1980, mm-hmm. um, and so that original donation included the main gallery, the lobby, and entrance area, um, the gift shop, and uh, some administrative office space. Yes, but s- several years after that, really a couple of decades after that. Uh, the museum uh, expanded into additional space. Um, in 1980, when, when the space was first donated uh, to Dr. Samela Lewis and the Museum of African American Art, um, there, there, this building was operated as a May Company department store. Oh. And when that May Company department store uh, phased out its furniture department, the museum actually expanded into additional space that we now use as uh, our event hall. Ah. We call it the event hall. We host events there. Yes. Um, but it's also an exhibit space. So we have two exhibit spaces, the main gallery where we are now and also the event hall. Excellent, excellent. And um, we should point out, I, by the way, that we're recording this on February the 27th because I mentioned before this is uh, Samela Lewis's or would have been her 100th birthday, and we're very proud of that. But Aceborn also did a commemorative piece as well. Uh, can you tell us about that? He did. He did. We're honored that, that we actually have uh, a beautiful uh, wall-sized uh, mural that is dedicated to Dr. Samela Lewis as the founder of the Museum of African American Art. Um, and, it, and it shows her um, in the middle of the mural and also uh, features a quote from her. Uh-huh. Um, and it's a quote uh, where she says, Generally speaking, the work is never finished. And that quote is actually from a time when uh, Samela was having a show uh, of her work and of her collection here at the Museum of African American Art. And she was doing a gallery walk and talk. Um, and she came to one of her own pieces and she, and she was talking about uh, uh, what was involved in, in creating that particular piece. And she paused and said, Generally speaking, the work is never finished. And so she was speaking about, you know, the way she thought about her own work ah. um, as being, you know, there's one always one more thing, one more brushstroke, one more thing you could do, yes. you know, to kind of perfect the piece. But also the way artists in general may think about their own work, whether they're painters or sculptors or, or collage artists. Yes. Um, and so, and so for, for me, you know, as a museum administrator, um, that statement is also also important because as you're working, you know, in a small nonprofit museum and, and keeping keeping things moving forward and honoring that legacy, that work is never is never finished either. Right. That work is is ongoing and requires, you know, a constant, you know, maintenance and vigilance and, and dedication and all of those things as well. Sure. And I would add to that uh, support from the community as well. So Absolutely. I'm encouraging everyone to visit the museum, see this exhibit, which is fantastic, and the other things that are on exhibit in the other exhibition rooms, and uh, become a member of this museum. I think it's uh, uh, an important institution with a long history and deserves all the respect uh, and support that we can provide. So I, I encourage everybody to do that. And that's all the thing I want to clarify. So it is, as we've said, it's in the uh, Macy's building, but the Macy's itself is closing, but Just to be clear, regardless of what happens with the Macy's uh, store, uh, the museum is not closing. Please, the museum absolutely. The museum is not closing. So um, sometimes maybe unclear uh, to the public, depending on you know how much they know about the museum's history. But the Museum of African American Art is an independent, uh, nonprofit uh, organization, and so and so we exist independently of Macy's. And just to go back th- through some of the museum's history in the building at 4005 Crenshaw Boulevard, which is where we are. Right. Um, so when, when we uh, came to be housed in, in the, what was in the May Company uh, department store, uh, the May Company was there for many, many decades. But the building has actually changed, uh, changed names and changed brands and changed ownership 
uh, at other times in, in the history of, of the museum. So it started out as, a, as the, the May Company uh, and then changed to Robinson's May and then most recently Macy's. Uh, and so what people may not realize that I know Macy's just announced that they don't intend to keep the, the store operating in this location. They just announced that in, in I think, early January. Mm-hmm. But the building itself was actually purchased and has been under new ownership since August of 2021. I see. And so uh, fortunately, the museum uh, has been in conversation with the, with the building's new ownership group, mm-hmm. which also happens to be the same group that purchased the mall, the Baldwin Hills Crenshaw Plaza. Right. So both the Baldwin Hills Crenshaw Plaza and this building where we are uh, at 4005 Crenshaw are now under the same ownership. And so we're happy that the museum has been, has been invited to stay in the, in the current location yeah. through the redevelopment period. Fantastic. Yes. And that's great to hear. And regardless of anything that happens in the future, one thing we can count on is the, uh, thanks to you, by the way, and all your efforts, is the continued existence and um, events and so forth that are sponsored here at the, uh, the museum. Absolutely. We plan to continue. Yes. And also, I just want to say another aspect of the museum, and it shows it's sort of a community commitment, is the space is used by uh, other groups to come in and actually do things, right? I mean, there was recently a teacher's conference, for example. Yes, it is. It is. So you're talking about the event hall space, yes, um, which we we call the space that we're in the main gallery, but the event hall space is actually much larger than the main gallery, and so it allows us to, uh, to actually host community events. Yes. Um, one of the one of the recent ones uh, that we're very proud of was actually a professional development day uh, that was hosted by the LA County Office of Education. Mm-hmm. So we had about 125 uh, local teachers from throughout Los Angeles County who, That's awesome. who were in our space in yes. the event hall yes. uh, to learn how best to teach African American studies uh, oh, wow. in their classrooms. That so is it's totally important, awesome. Very important. So on so many levels, that's cool because uh, for one thing, you, the space was made available for that, and for another, the teachers thought enough of the subject matter to train their teachers on how to do it even better than they probably were doing it before. So that's awesome. Absolutely. Yeah, just another important reason to keep supporting this uh, museum to provide things like that. It's a part of our history that we're really, really proud of that that function in the com- community as a gathering space. Yes. As a place to come, as a trusted place to come for events like that. Yes. And as you mentioned, you know, you're featuring like this Ace Born exhibit uh, uh, demonstrates you're exhibiting up and coming artists and so forth that are from this area or nearby. But another aspect is the collection that the museum has. And so can you talk a little bit about that, especially the Palmer Hayden uh, works? Sure. So we, we uh, and this is something that we, that we clarify um, for, for the public a lot, too, um, because when you come into the museum and you see an exhibit, there's sometimes um, not, not a lot of clarity that we, that we are a museum versus a gallery, yes. that we are a museum because we have a permanent collection yeah. that we care for, um, that, that does not rotate, that stays with us, that we are responsible for, uh, for caring for and preserving and, and having conservation work done on. So the most um, sort of central part of the museum's permanent collection is the Palmer C. Hayden collection. And uh, that's 40 works by uh, leading Harlem Renaissance artist Palmer C. Hayden. And those 40 works include both oils and uh, watercolors, so works on paper, Mm -hmm. mostly oils. Um, And within that collection of 40 works is also uh, a a series of 12 works um, uh, based on the ballad of John Henry. And we call it the John Henry series. So it's a series within that collection. Which is probably one of his most famous groups of paintings. And he he was such a passionate uh, follower and observer and reader of the John Henry uh, story that he converted it into 12 pieces. It's just fantastic. He was, he was. And it's an amazing, it's an amazing uh, series. It's very uh, accessible to people when they walk through and see it. It's almost like walking through the pages of a, of a storybook. Yes. Uh, and that story, of course, is the same um, story that's told in the in the legendary ballad of, of John Henry. Yes. 
And the one thing I can remember, so the other museum here in L.A. is the California African American Museum. I know some years ago, this museum loaned that museum uh, some of Palmer Hayden's pieces. Yes. And so that's yes. another important aspect. You're stewards of the collection, but you make it available not only here at this museum, but uh, other museums that may want to borrow the pieces. Absolutely. We also receive uh, image requests, um, mostly for works that are in that Palmer Hayden collection, often for works that are in the John Henry series um, specifically. And so uh, authors, uh, textbook publishers, other museums uh, that are publishing catalogs often use our images. And uh, we, we're talking about Palmer Hayden, but are there any other um, pieces that stand out in the collection that you might want to mention to our listeners and viewers? There are. So there are quite a few uh, noted noted artists whose work is represented in the museum's collection outside of the Palmer Hayden um, series. We have one work, um, just as we're talking about, about the museum's role of uh, conserving and preserving the works. We have one work. Um, by Charles White to work on paper awesome. um, that we're currently, uh, you know, having looked at for some some conservation work. Yes, uh, we have another work uh, by Hale Woodruff. Um, it's a beautiful piece that's that's on display. Both of those actually, the, the Charles White and the Hale Woodruff, are, are on display in the exhibit. I'm sorry, in the uh, event hall. Yes, exhibit that we have in the larger space. So. Uh, that's yes. that, that's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Charles White, of course, uh, well, he died in 1979, but uh, he taught at Otis for a while. He's one of the most respected artists uh, in the whole canon of African-American art, looking back at the time. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So I thought maybe we'd shift just for a moment to, to you um, personally. So uh, you, were you, where were you born? I was born uh, in Los Angeles. Huh? Um, I grew up in Inglewood, California. Excellent. Yes. And where did you uh, go to school? When I say school, I mean college, I should say. So I, I went to Howard University. Oh, wow. I Howard did University. in Washington, D.C., absolutely, yes. And, and what was your major? My major was English. Ah, okay. Mm-hmm. Okay, now that's, uh, you know, it's going <laughs> to tempt me to go in this other direction. But I'm, before we do that, though, so um, how did you end up uh, here at the museum then? If your major is English. You went to school in uh, uh, D.C. So I actually, um, I... My very first job in high school was working in the museum's gift shop. This museum? This museum of African American art. You are kidding In this me. location. No way. I worked in the gift shop in high school on weekends. <laughs> Excellent. I did. So yeah, you have a long history basically with this museum then. I do. Down to it. Okay. I do. I live in the neighborhood. Uh-huh. So it's definitely... Um, it's all of the efforts, you know, that go into... To, to keeping the legacy going, yes, are all of those efforts are a labor of love for me, um, and and an act of of stewardship of of what is a gem, you know, in the community where I live. Oh, that's fantastic! So it has a special meaning then, obviously, it does. and a more more personal connection as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So after you finished uh, college, did you go to graduate school also at Howard? As I recall, I, I did. I did with some years in between. Oh, okay. I, I actually came back came back to Los Angeles and worked um, as an editor um, for a while. Okay. And uh, then went back, went back to graduate school at, at Howard. Howard. At Howard. Still, still English? Still English oh. with a concentration in African-American literature. Oh, wow. Fantastic. Yes. And so after you finished that, did you stay in D.C. or did you come back to Los Angeles? I came back to Los Angeles after that. Okay. I did. I was in D.C. Um, for a total of about six years with a little break in between. Oh, uh, okay. I did come back. Oh, okay. When you first came back from L.A., um, excuse me, from D.C. to L.A., uh, what were you doing then? I worked as an editor um, for Entrepreneur Magazine. Ah. And I worked. I'm familiar with that publication. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. I worked uh on AAA's Westways magazine as well. I'm a AAA member. Yes, I get that magazine. Yes, yes. Every so, so editing was was kind of the the, the bread and butter at that time. Oh, okay. Um, and that's kind of uh, the way that I stayed in touch with the Museum of African American Art as well was uh, was that I did a lot of writing for the museum, uh, press releases, oh, really? uh, invitations, flyers, postcards, uh, and eventually the website. Um, so you worked on their website. I back did. In the day. I did. And so when did you become the executive director? 
Uh, that was fairly recently. I, I just stepped into the role of executive director uh, in mid twenty twenty. Um, during the during the height of the height of the pandemic, COVID, yeah. absolutely, when the museum uh, and all museums in LA County were still required and mandated uh, to be closed right. during that time, I recall that very well. Yes, uh, yeah, because I was on the LA County Arts Commission, and we weren't uh, supposed to meet in person. We all that was my big introduction to Zoom, for example. Right. <laughs> I'd heard about it, but never really used it that much until right. COVID hit. Yes, for us all, we yeah. all we all. Converted over to, to, to Zoom and learn very quickly. Yeah, <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, and so, so since, uh, so really you just started right after, right, or excuse me, during, during. Uh, COVID. That's 2020 then. And in that short space of time, I just must say, you've overseen a tremendous um, improvement in this space here. I Thank just you. noticed it. Yeah. <laughs> Bright Thank colors you. and Thank new you. lighting and all well, kinds of stuff is going on know, in here. You know, while we were closed and really completely, completely shut down for that time period, yeah. you know, we said there's, there's things we can still do behind the scenes. And so let's do those things that we can do uh, to be ready yes. to reopen. And yeah. so we have all new, new lighting throughout the museum, uh, you know, new paint, um, all of that, uh, you know. Yeah, it's like uh, a, it's like it's a rebirth. It's like it's it like really a renaissance. Is. It really is. It's a change, and it corresponds with that kind of that feeling of reemerging post pandemic. Yes. You know, and turning that page and, and entering a new chapter. There's a wonderful vibe, definitely. Thank you. Yeah, you're you're bringing such positive, uh, uplifting uh, energy to this museum and the space in particular. So. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, back to you personally. So as I understand it, uh, you've written some uh, poems over the years. Or do you still do you still do that? I do. Yeah, I do that. You know, as we talk about what's what's, you know, the relationship between the, the English, the English major and the, the arts administrator. And for me, it, it's all storytelling. Yes. So language, you know, is an art as well. You know, it's a humanity. And so the visual arts are a form of storytelling. Yes. You know, and, and la the language arts are ways of storytelling. Um, so there's that connection. I love that. I love that. The interconnectivity of all the arts. Absolutely. Music, language, visual, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Well, what I was wondering is if, uh, putting you on the spot here, if you would be uh, willing to read one of your uh, poems. I would. Okay. And I just, while, while you're choosing, I just wanted to let everybody, remind everybody that we've done poets. Uh, we had Lynn Thompson uh, on, for example. She was a previous podcast guest, and she's a poet. So we, we appreciate the in interconnectivity of all the arts, and especially appreciate poetry, music, and so on. So maybe we'll start with, um, since we're in the museum, we'll start with a visitor to the museum. Excellent. I love it. An Perfect. encounter. Perfect. With a visitor. Perfect. That resulted in a poem. Okay. So. And this is called Woman Unhoused in the Museum. It's from 2021. I did not hear her come in. She manifested suddenly mid-floor, standing still like a ghost. She was dressed in layers of shirts and long skirts and draped with bags and a guitar, or at least its remnants. There was just the face and strings. What instrument do you play, I asked. Oh, any of them, she said, all of them. She tapped lightly on the tall drum, took a brochure, touched things because she was allowed, tinkered gently with the ornate mudcloth vest and kufi artifacts near the door. Assalamu alaikum, she said. Peace be upon you. Walaikum assalam, I returned, and upon you be peace. What's your name, she asked. Keisha, I said. By Aisha, she replied. I accepted my renaming. 
Take care, I offered as she was leaving. She waved with one hand, slowly, above her head. But she did not stop walking, and she did not turn around. I wondered how she knew I was still watching. That is awesome. You know, it's funny. I can visualize what you, what you were saying as you were saying it, too, because as you walk into that lobby area, there's that big, tall drum. And what we did say earlier is that that's part of the African art collection that's part of this museum, too, correct? It is. Yeah. It right. is indeed. So I'm going to invite you to maybe read one more. Would you feel up to the, doing one more? Sure. Okay. I don't know if you'll help me choose a, if you'll help me choose a topic. Here. Okay. Well, let's see. What, what are the options? See, there's one, there's one about George Floyd. Okay. There's one about Kobe Bryant. Okay. There's one about the earth. Can I ask? Mother Earth. Oh, my God. During the pandemic. Oh, my God. Can, can, you, read, can you read two of them then? Sure. Would that be too much to ask? <laughs> Not so at all. Mother Earth, no of course, is okay. one. And then the uh, George Floyd one, if you don't mind. Okay. Nothing against Kobe, by the way. Let's and, do that. Yeah, yeah. So we'll do... I'll do Mother Earth okay. first, maybe. Okay, sounds good. And again, this is, this is written during 2020, during the pandemic. During the pandemic, okay. And it's called Mother Earth to Humans. I can relieve myself of you if you insist on going big, everywhere, all the time, in error, with no rhyme or reason, I can change the season of your existence. I can go very small, unseen, hardly understood at all, send you into a spiral and by myself, time. Stop you in your tracks worldwide to bring myself back. I can cleanse the tides and reblue the skies, let pollution subside while humans stay inside to save your own lives, which you would not do to save mine. No, you needed to drive. Everything you did was essential to your small life and its nagging potential, but I required you to leave and bought myself a reprieve from your constant destruction. I let the wind blow again through the forest of my hair and made my own repairs at great cost to you who undervalued my warnings when I said I could not breathe. You kept cutting down my trees, spilling oil throughout my seas, eroding my coral reefs, littering my shores and beaches, melting through my glacier sheets. Still, I am the big picture. Humanity has been a fixture, but it is not a given that Mother Earth will let you keep living here. Let the birds sing praise at my revival. Mother Earth has gone viral. <laughs> That's so great and timely. I mean, given the climate change situation and what we're dealing with, I mean, uh, yes, uh, that's, that's beautiful. Okay, so I, I trouble you one more, uh, the George Floyd one. I'm just curious. And this one, of course, needs no I explanation. Think, no, exactly. It's a horrible situation that took place. <sighs> so it's called George Floyd Incantation, written in 2020. Have you no humanity, neither any shame, smirking over my body in a kind of game? The godless are yet among us. What the devil have you done? Allow me to explain to you how justice will be won. You'll never be free of me. You cannot hide any place. For so long as you have a knee, you will also have my face. Staring at you from beyond, everywhere you dare to turn, waiting for you to cross over, to show you 
what you've earned. Until then, a thing unknown will come upon you unaware, and you'll get a quiet feeling that it's me standing there. Forever bigger and stronger, eternally the better man. With my spirit soaring free, now catch me if you can. I could not breathe, and you'll never rest, outnumbered by visions, outgunned by regrets. You'll never live it down, no matter what you believe. I'll always be around. There is no reprieve. There is no repentance that spares you, my ghost. I am your life sentence, and I'm doing the most. You thought it was over with my head to the ground and your hand in your pocket, but I'll never back down. As long as you breathe like I couldn't, I will keep standing up like you wouldn't, looming large in your head where I'm always awake. In exchange for my years, your peace of mind I will take. Every moment you have, I will confront you. You'll be able to breathe, but you won't want to. When you cry out for help, when you want to get up, you'll be pinned to your deeds with no such luck. If you seek forgiveness, perhaps you should beg, like I did when my neck was under your leg. People might hear you, nothing they can do, once the ancestors have you in plain view. God bless your heart against the undead, spirits in high places, Stand me in good stead, on righteous wings carried with the wind, everywhere at once and without end. Against my bound hands did you raise your sword, but vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. You neither saw nor heard that last breath I swallowed, and you missed it when you got up and I followed. Oh, that's very, very powerful. And let me just say thank you so much for sharing uh, on those those three wonderful poems. You're welcome. Yeah, awesome. Thank the you. museum is very fortunate because you bring to it so much uh, in addition to the administrative part of it that you have this, I think, artistic sensibility that comes from being an artist yourself. So I think that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank so you. back to uh, the museum itself, I think I remember that you were on, on video testifying? Was it some sort of, uh, can you tell us about that, I was, that experience? I was, yeah. that was, that was in 2020, 2021. Okay. Um, actually toward the end of the, the one year that uh, museums in LA County were mandated to be closed, I was involved in some, some arts advocacy work uh -huh. uh, and was invited to share testimony as part of a hearing on the joint of uh, the, the California State Assembly's Joint Committee on the Arts, uh, had a hearing on restarting the arts. Oh, okay. Uh, as we were just starting to kind of contemplate what emerging from the pandemic would look like for oh. arts organizations, including museums. And so uh, my testimony at that time in early 2021 took the form of a, of a poem uh, oh. as well. Oh, okay. Yes. So, so you asked. Oh, okay. And the, the subject of the poem was what? The subject of the poem was really um, the museum, oh, <laughs> the Museum of African American Art, yeah. um, kind of as an example of what museums, especially small museums in communities statewide do mm. uh, for, for constituents in those communities. I see. Um, Fantastic. And that's something that somebody could click a link on, right, to see, I think, as I recall. It's true. Yeah, it's yeah. true. One of the public information. It so. is. Yeah. One of the one of the uh, one of the state assembly members uh, who attended who attended the hearing where I offered that testimony poem, as I call it, uh, she actually posted a video of the poem on no YouTube. Way. So it's there. Oh, that's it's fantastic. There. <laughs> it was. It was a surprise. <laughs> so uh, yes. that's very nice. Have you done anything similar to that? Not necessarily a poem per se, uh, but any kind of other uh, arts advocacy? Uh, I have. I have. I had a 
really a long and, and wonderful relationship with the California Association of Museums from about 2014 to 20. To 2020, Uh um, I was a member of the California Association of Museums uh, Board of Directors. Um, And so I started out on their government relations committee, also uh, served on their membership committee, uh, was a a vice president for a couple of years uh, for the California Association of Museums. And of course, as you know, that is a statewide um, uh, museum professional and arts advocacy organization uh, okay. that does amazing work and has for many years. Fantastic. And is it based in Los Angeles? It's actually based in Northern California. Oh, okay. It's actually not, not, not here in Los Angeles, but, but of course serves museums uh, statewide. Across the state, right? Okay. Absolutely. And, and you were a board member for a while. I was. Uh, okay. I was. I first joined the, the Government Relations Committee. Okay. Um, and that really was because... The Museum of African American Art, because of its role uh, within the community, we often had attendance at at the museum's exhibit openings and other community events, Mm -hmm. attendance by elected officials. And so all of our all of our local elected officials from from city to county um, to state and even even our Congress, Congress, uh, congressional representatives had been to events at the museum. Oh, okay. And so there was just this question of how we, we might be able to use um, that dynamic to have a larger conversation about the work that museums do oh. across the state. And the museum, I'm taking it, is is itself a member of this organization. Is it is. Yeah. We are. We are members of the California Association of Museums. And the other thing to clarify, or maybe this was made clearer earlier, I'm not sure, but the museum itself is a private museum, right? It's not a state museum. That's correct. Yeah. And so we, we are uh, a private and independent non, non-profit, non-profit. Uh, museum. And so we uh, are primarily funded through our memberships, donations, and the grants that we apply for. We do not have any kind of regular um, city, county, uh, state, or federal funding. Uh, okay. That's important to point out. And, yeah. Yep. So, great. <laughs> So, okay, so um, you were telling me uh, off camera earlier that uh, the archives, if I get this correct, are going to be digitized. Can you talk about that a little bit? So that's actually, that's a great question. It's part of the work that we started during the, the, sh- the, the shutdown, during the pandemic. Yep. So in addition to making upgrades and changes to our physical space, we actually received uh, a grant from uh, California uh, humanities to to begin some some digitization. So it was an art, it's a combination of art inventory mm-hmm. and also digitization. So we're in the probably the second about well, the second phase of that uh, digitization work. Yes, and so we're known for the museum's uh, exhibits and for our collections. What many people don't know is that we actually have an extensive archive. Of, of paper, of documents. Um, some of those are papers associated with the artist whose, whose work we're best known for, which is Palmer Hayden. Mm-hmm. We have some papers related to his life and his work. Uh, but we also have institutional archives that really um, uh, lay out the history of, of the museum and the exhibits that we have had over the years, the founding, the locations, mm. All of that information is is in, is in our archives. That's exciting. And so we're we're in the process of of uh, of digitizing those materials and, and making make, making, making them available. available. Oh wow! Or one of the things that I mentioned earlier that we we receive image requests mm-hmm. mostly for works in the Palmer Hayden collection, right. um, but we also receive research requests. Um, people, uh, galleries, authors. Um, Folks who are looking for information about artists who may have exhibited pre, pre-digital era, sure, yeah. <laughs> may have exhibited at the museum. And so we have files, individual artist files from the 70s, the 80s, uh, the 90s uh, wow. that have not been digitized. And so we're in that, we're in that process right now. Well, that is exciting to it hear. Is. And do you... Uh, have an expected uh, completion date for that, or do you know? I don't know what, what kind of spot. We, you know, we don't roughly. have a we don't have a 
we don't have a hard uh, completion sure. date, but it's going to take us. It's going to take us a couple of years. There's a large volume because there's photographs too. By the way, photographs, I think, I think slides, yeah, thirty-five yeah. millimeter slides. Oh wow, even. that takes uh, me back. <laughs> yes, well, well, and again, back to those artist files when artists were either submitting proposals or had already been, you know, accepted to do exhibits uh, at the museum in those earlier years. Yeah. Uh, they would also submit slides of their work. They didn't uh-huh. have websites, right, that exactly. you could just go to. They would submit 35 millimeter, you know, slides showing I, showing examples of their work. I can recall as a gallery owner getting those myself from artists who are yes. saying, hey, show me in your gallery kind of a thing. So I can yes. relate to that 35 millimeter and sometimes uh, even the sort of point and shoot uh, pictures on a, you know, just a regular piece of paper kind of a thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um and then those photographs, by the way, I was pretty exciting. I saw a few of them over the years and had folks like Maya Angelou and a whole host of familiar celebrity names, too, that have been through the gallery, oh, the museum here over the years. It's true. There are some some really amazing people who, who have supported the Museum of African American Art. Uh, over the years, many of them served, you know, uh, as as board members yes. or uh, in other important roles, uh, just recognizing the importance of the museum and supporting that over the years. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a rich history that, uh, well, I think most people be interested in just in general, but if you are doing some sort of specific research, it's going to be a great resource for that. Yeah, we're excited to share the archives. Yeah, yeah. Very, very excited. Oh, Fantastic. And is there anything else I'm overlooking? I mean, uh, what else are you guys up to here at the museum uh, presently? Uh, well, events um, and exhibits. That's our. That's, that's kind that's of our. The, the it's what we do. Thing, it's yeah. what we do. Yeah. And so we're we're really excited that we um, have had a relationship over the years, really, with with Metro. Um, ah. Metro has its own art department. Metro as in Metro Rail. Metro Rail, um, we, LA City, right? LA, yes, yes, absolutely. And so we are. So our location at 4005 uh, Crenshaw Boulevard is at the intersection of Crenshaw and Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevards. And so, as you know, uh, that is where the Metro Rail's MLK uh, station is located. Ah. So we're right near a newly opened. Uh, metro rail line and specifically right near the MLK station and so and that's that's operational as we speak right it is it oh. it, it just became just became uh, operational within the last uh, several months or so oh, okay and we're very very uh, excited that one of our upcoming exhibits will be with with Metro and it will be uh, an exhibit that showcases the work uh, of the artists whose artwork is featured on the eight, uh, in the eight stations along the, the Crenshaw LAX line, which is called the K line. Oh, so it'll okay. be a group, a group exhibit featuring the work of those artists. Wow. And when will that take place? That is scheduled to open uh, in May of oh, wow. 2023. So we're kind of close. It's coming up. Well, it's that's, coming up. That's very exciting. I can remember... Uh, uh, Berlinda Fontenot Jameson, your predecessor, yes. actually was talking about that when she was the executive director here. And I think I remember her saying she was going to be a part of the Crenshaw uh, organization. I forgot now what it yes, was called. Yes. Well, the Metro, uh, Metro's art department actually you know, had to wait, of course, until the line was finished, sure. until the rail line was actually completed. And yes. so with that having been completed, the K line having been uh, completed recently, they're ready to go with the, with the art exhibit. <laughs> oh, that's excellent. That's excellent. Now, this is uh, Black History Month that we're recording in. Did the museum uh, do anything in particular uh, with regard to Black History Month? We didn't have uh, really a special program for Black History Month. What happens usually for us um, is that we get uh, an increase in requests for visits. <laughs> so tour groups, school groups, <coughs> um, the, LA, the LA County Office of Education had its, its uh, African American Studies Symposium that we were talking about earlier. So that, that's what happens for us. It's a kind of an uptick, a dramatic uptick, really, um, in requests for visits and tours and events. And we are a... Um, you know, a beautiful cultural space where people like to have that sort of backdrop as they're doing their Black History Month 
uh, celebrations and events. Well, another good reason for having Black History Month, right? Absolutely. <laughs> and Absolutely. that's the thing, I think, for this museum. I mean, every month is Black History Month. It, really, it really is. And we tell people that, too, as, as, we're, as we, we know that, that uh, different organizations, and especially schools and other institutions uh, like that, have, have maybe a budget for, you know, for yeah. Black History Month, and they're trying to spend it all in February and yes. do it all in February. We have to <laughs> remind people we're here. We're here. Twelve months out of the year, we're right? We're here and we're us <laughs> all year long. Please don't try to squeeze it all into February. We will be here. We're here all year long and welcome well, well, welcome all of those community and cultural uh, events at any time of the year. <laughs> excellent, excellent. That is funny, though. That is, uh, I could see where you would have that uptick in interest and, and so forth for do. for having Black History Month events. And it's just it nice you're able to accommodate them, too. I think that's fantastic. It is. It is. Well, we, we see that as really part of our part of our role in the community is, yes. is to is to be a space that is accessible, yes. you know, um, that is usable, that is a is a gathering space um, for folks. Yes. It's important. And back to the Palmer Hayden collection, which is, as you pointed out, one of the most important aspects of the permanent collection. I should also point out, as I forgot to bring this up when we were talking about it, is that there was a very nicely illustrated uh, catalog that went along with it, right? And the museum itself published the catalog at the time. It's true. Which, which was yes. probably in the late 80s, I think. It, it was, was in 1988. 1988. It was the original... Uh, the original uh, exhibit catalog from when uh, the museum's uh, Palmer Hayden collection was first shown yes. as, a, as an exhibit. And I just want to say, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you have several copies, and if anybody's interested, they can actually purchase them, correct? Or is that, or is that not right? We have fewer and fewer copies. Oh, it's dwindling. <laughs> the copies are they're dwindling. Oh, okay. I, I'm trying to kind of... Um, strategically place those now. Ah, okay. We one of the things we'd like to do as we as we look at um, digitizing and look at um, the materials uh, surrounding the Palmer Hayden collection, we'd actually like to reprint that catalog ah. um, and update it. Maybe update the information. Sure. Reprint it and make that available to the public. Uh, I think that's a great idea. I hope that comes through. That would be very nice because the catalog itself is really fantastic. Uh, and Samela Lewis, of course, was instrumental in having that collection uh, actually donated to the museum, if I'm not mistaken, by she Palmer was. Hayden's widow, Miriam Hayden. That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. Um, uh, Dr. Samela Lewis uh, was a friend of the artist, was a friend of, uh, of Palmer Hayden's. And so um, it was re really that relationship uh, with, with Palmer Hayden and with his wife, Miriam Hayden, uh, that led to uh, that that subsequent donation of those works to the Museum of African American Art. Just one more example of how remarkable of a woman Dr. Samela Lewis was. I mean, here she, she is. Was. She's an artist herself, and so and then she's authoring books. She's writing books to tell us about Elizabeth Catlett and the general category of Black American art. And she and at the time, you know, you have to think about this, and we have to remind ourselves of this. Uh, that at the time that she was writing, um, the books, I mean, you know, the, the saying goes, someone wrote the book on a certain subject. Dr. Samela Lewis wrote what was at the time the book, right? right? And the books, plural, right. uh, on African-American art. At a time when the category itself was just being overlooked. It was just another example of the detrimental effects of racism in the country, just uh, dismissing the creative output of such a, an important American institution, important American segment of the culture and so forth, I think. Uh, and she was so instrumental in so many ways. Starting this museum, she started that uh, publication, the International Review, which was Black Arts Quarterly in the beginning. Yes, yes. And, uh, and she was she was the editor for many, many Editor for, yeah, exactly. Uh and, and an artist herself in her own right, painter and so forth. A master artist yeah. in her own right. right. So an incredible, incredible person, an incredible woman um, with, with a powerful legacy yes. that we're honored you know, to, be, to, be able to, to, to be able to continue through the museum's work. I was going to say thank you again to you and to Aceborn for having that idea to do a tribute piece and for him to have completed it 
and it's now available for people to look at when they walk into the lobby of this museum. I think it's worth uh, spending a few minutes there. And thank you it for is. sharing that story about the saying that she said about it not being finished and so forth. Absolutely. Okay. That's, and that's it, incorporated into the piece itself. Right, and having the mural in our space, yes. you know, in the museum just creates a, just a beautiful opportunity to tell the story of Dr. Uh, Dr. Lewis's work and to tell the story of the museum's founding. Yes. I think as people come in and they see the mural. Yes, I think it's fabulous. And again, I get goosebumps saying this out loud that we're actually recording this on February 27th, her 100th birthday, February 27th, 2023. And I don't know, it seems to lend a special significance on top of everything else. It does. It's it's very, very fitting. Yes. Yes. And so we've talked a, a bit about what's in the future for the museum, but is there anything else that we should be aware of that um, that's coming in the, in the near future for the Museum of American Art? I think we've I covered think we've everything. Kind of covered it. The digitizing yeah, we have the, of the, the digitizing. Archive. We have we do have um, uh, conservation work going on ah. with, with the Palmer Hayden collection. I don't know if we touched on. No, that. let's talk about. We that. talked about upcoming exhibits. We talked about digitization of the archives. Yes, yes. But the Palmer Hayden collection um, itself is currently not on display at the museum, as we are embarking on a a longer term, you know, kind of overhaul uh, from, a, from a conservation perspective um, and gathering funding to conserve those works and have the recommended treatments uh, done on that entire collection. And it should be pointed out, that's another important function performed by this museum and museums in general, and that is not just presenting the uh, works and holding exhibitions and documenting and so forth, but helping to preserve it. I mean, those Hayden pieces were created in the uh, mid 20th century. So they're ga- getting older and all of the material that's used in the making, like oil on canvas and watercolors and so forth. Watercolors are particularly sensitive to light and UV rays, for instance. Yes. And so it raises this issue of uh, how to properly preserve them for the future so future generations can enjoy them. And we're very fortunate that the museum here is embarking on that. So you're doing both the um, oils and the watercolors in terms of the we conservation are. work. We are. The entire collection, all 40 works, so um, including the oils and yes. the watercolors, they are under, under that, uh, you know, kind of long-term project of, of conservation. Um, separately, of course, because we have separate separate conservators who work on on the the watercolors works on paper um as opposed to the the oils and so that work is ongoing like you said they have to be they have to be cleaned they have to be conserved yes um and in our case with a collection um that is going back to i think there are works there from about the late 20s early 30s yes going all the way through the early 70s that's and he, kind of the time span of our collection here at the museum our palmer hayden collection spans those dates and so there's there's quite a range and that's so important to note too because palmer died in 1973 he did but and as you mentioned when you first started speaking about him he was an important Harlem renaissance painter and the renaissance itself began in 1919 and was in yes. the early 20s. He won the Harmon Foundation Prize. And next thing you know, he's over in France and he's learning Paris. more and more in Paris and so forth. That's so correct. for the museum to have such a wide range of his work on top of having the famous John Henry series, but it's also the range of the works. So you kind of see him develop as an artist in terms of his technique and his subject matter choices and so forth, right? It's true. You can see kind of how he how he evolved over over, over his own lifetime as an artist. Yes. And how about you, by the way? I mean, I'm glad to hear. We were so fortunate to have you read your own poems and to know that you actually, what a, what a creative and unique way to do it, to have a testimony that in itself is a poem. I thought that was, I thought that was very, very nice. Um, Thank you. What about you uh, in your own artistic pursuits? Are you still, you probably can't resist the impulse, if I'm guessing, uh, to write a poem as you're inspired to do so. Is that still ongoing? It's true. I, I, uh, I write. It's part of who I am, just as other artists may paint or sculpt or, sure. or, uh, or do other kinds of, of visual work. Yes. I work with words. 
That's and awesome. words work with me sometimes, like it or not. You can't. Uh, the you can't words help are it. there. The <laughs> words are there. Sometimes it's just how how I uh, express the things that are important to me. So, do you write more than just poems? Do you write nonfiction, or, and do you write like novels and stuff like that? Or what's the no, extent? I don't. It's just poetry. Just the poetry. Um, you know, I write. Of course, still write things uh, that are. Uh, more functional and maybe more mundane like grants <laughs> ah, the fun stuff right <laughs> and uh, you know I, I wrote the museums uh the museums uh dei statement and, and things like that so tell us um, what is that D- dei uh diversity equity and inclusion ah. statement okay yeah yeah well you know what though I mean, i'm imagining i mean this is not similar to poetry but still you have to sum it up yeah, the That's right true. words to express whatever it is you need to express. So having that uh, background true. and inclination probably helps out a lot when you do that. It does. Mundane stuff. So it's it great. does. It does. <laughs> it really and, does. And the museum is fortunate that you can bring that to the to the table. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, it's all it's all part it's all part of it. You know. Yes. We, we use our talents um, in multiple and our ways. strengths. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And so when this uh, exhibition comes down in April, is there one that's scheduled to replace it? I'm just curious. The next exhibit uh, in this space, in the main gallery, is actually the Metro. Oh, that's the one that's coming. The Metro, the group show featuring the work of artists uh, whose work is featured on the Crenshaw LAX line at those stations. So those artists whose work is already at those eight stations along the Crenshaw LAX line, the K line, yes. will do a group show here at the Museum of African American Art In this very following room. this exhibit. So this exhibit closes um, April 30th. Oh, April 30th, and sorry. And then uh, the Metro exhibit will, will open later in May. Later in May, fantastic. Something to, to uh, mark your calendars for once it's uh, a definite date established and so forth, and I encourage everybody to come out and check it out. Thank you. <laughs> well, listen, uh, Keisha, thank you so much for not only talking to us about the museum, but also sharing your poems. Very delightful and very uh, touching. And so we, uh, I really appreciate you doing that and sharing your perspective on uh, Eric's perspective. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks again for having me. <laughs> okay. Everybody, thank you for tuning in. And please do not forget to subscribe. Thanks a lot. See you next time. Thank you.